Okay, everyone. Good evening. Um, on behalf of the Mises Institute, we're so excited for uh, you all to be here for the best week of the year. Um, I think this year that hurdle might be a little bit you know, lower than, than past years, but uh, again, this is going to be a great week. Um, you know, as Jeff Dice described it a few years ago, Mises University is uh, the week where the civilized world fights back. And I think especially with everything that's been going on uh, the last few months, it's exactly what we need. Um, so for those that don't know me, uh, my name is Stho Bishop, uh, and among my responsibilities at the Institute, I help with social media. Um, so you can do me a big favor uh, just by using social media throughout the week, you know, Instagram, Twitter, all that, um, you know, hashtag MisesU. Uh, you know, always love retweeting MisesU students so we can kind of you know, bump up your numbers during this week for followers, which always helps. Um, also, one note that it's going to be very warm uh, this week, as it usually is in July in, in uh, Auburn. Um, but it will be cold inside. So you know, when you are, are coming over, no matter how hot it is outside, it, it sometimes you, know, it, you, you may want to bring something a little bit warmer um, while you're here. So with all that being said, it's my great uh, honor to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Zos uh, Joe Salerno. Thank you, and um, welcome to the 35th year of Mises University. We've had more than that, because in some years we've had two. Uh, it's great to see everybody's fresh and unmasked face in front of me here. I, I love it. I'm not going to say anything about the guy with the mask back there. But, uh, okay. um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm the director of, uh, uh, rather, vice president of academic affairs and the director of, of Mises University. And um, it's actually my 31st or 32nd year of uh, being here uh, at the Mises University, either as uh, a professor or, or as, as a director. So to begin with, I would like to thank our generous donors who make, make Mises University possible. So please join me in a round of applause. <laughs> My main um, re uh, reason for, for giving a few remarks tonight is, is to give you an idea of what it was like in the bad old days before Mises University if you were a college student who wanted to learn about Austrian economics. So I'll take my own example. Um, I was a college student in the 1970s. And uh, when I first discovered Austrian economics in my, my junior year in college, there was no educational conferences available like Mises University. My first Austrian conference was very small. It consisted of me. Um, during the summer between my junior and senior years, uh, I worked as a janitor. Uh, I, I, would, I would usually finish my work early and, and then hide in a, in a sort of a windowless and, and stuffy, cramped um, uh, closet, uh, you know, amidst brooms and mops and cleaning fluid. And I, and I, began, and I would read uh, Murray Rothbard's America's Great Depression. So, you know, I felt so alone. I mean, I was alone. I was in the closet by myself reading a book. <laughs> um, until I graduated college, I had never met another living Austrian. So I was finally able to come out of the closet, the janitor's closet, that is, <laughs> as an Austrian and, and meet other live Austrians in 1974 when I attended the first Austrian conference held in North America. Uh, it was held in a tiny and actually very spooky town in Vermont, um, south, called South Royalton. Uh, the place had no street lights, and at night you could hear, you could actually hear wolves or coyotes. I mean, my, my New Jersey ears couldn't tell which, which it was. But uh, maybe you can talk to Jeff Herbner later, lives in western Pennsylvania, and he can. But anyway, so they would be banging at the edge of town. Uh, the inhabitants you met never acknowledged you. They just stared blankly ahead like the pod people in Invasion of the Body Snatchers. <laughs> anyway, the Austrian movement was, has grown way beyond my belief since the, the famous South Royalton Conference. And, and Mises University has had a lot to do with that, a tremendous amount to do with that. Um, thousands of, stu of different students have gone through Mises University since it first started in 1986. More than 100 different faculty members have taught at Mises University over the years. Um, as the number of professional Austrian economists has grown and Austrian research has expanded into new areas, the faculty has become larger and, and our, the variety of our courses uh, has expanded. So this year, for example, at Mises U, we have courses on topics as diverse as praxeology uh, and socialist calculation to how entrepreneurs built the world and the economics of winning an election. So we have, have very abstract lectures and lectures that are very, very applied. And all of it is in, in, informed by 
um, Murray Rothbard's view of, of economics, which was based on, on Ludwig von Mises. So let me say a few words about um, Murray Rothbard. Uh, so amid all the progress and change, one thing remains, has remained constant, and that is that Mises' view has remained true to the founding vision of Murray Rothbard, uh, who really was the inspiration in, in designing it as a venue to teach and, and disseminate Mises' approach to economics. Uh, let me just say a few words about the relationship between Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard, because recently there's been some, some confusion, I would say, about this issue. Rothbard always considered himself a student and follower of, of Mises. He devoted himself heart and soul to advancing and applying Mises' praxeological approach economics. In fact, Rothbard doubled down on, on, on this mission in the late 1970s and, ne and early 1980s when some Austrians tried to downplay Mises because they thought Mises was too radical and uncompromising and therefore would not appeal to mainstream economists and potential donors to the Austrian movement because the Austrian movement didn't have many resources um, prior to the founding of, uh, of, of the Mises Institute in 1982. So the intransigent, as some people have called Mises, the intransigent or very stubborn Mises was supposed to be replaced as the guiding light of Austrian economics by his student, Friedrich Hayek. Hayek was supposedly, and he really wasn't, but he was supposedly much more tolerant towards mathematical and Keynesian economists and more restrained and tactful than Mises in his criticisms, and to some extent, he was the latter. Hayek, um, to give you an idea of the attitude toward Mises that prevailed in those dark days, I will recount two personal experiences. One day I met with two other Austrian professors after I had just completed re reading Mises' um, intellectual autobiography, Notes and Recollections. And I, I recommend that to everyone. It's a very simple and quick read, and, and it's very, very informative about the early Austrian movement and Mises' own place in it. In any case, all three of us were involved in starting a program in Austrian economics at Rutgers University that was funded by a private donor. When I praised the book to my two colleagues, uh, they just smiled indulgently at me, you know, as adults sometimes do when, when children say stupid things. Um, they then told me the book was a complete disaster for modern Austrian economics because Mises sounded like a cranky, intolerant, and, and bitter old man. Similarly, when Lou Rockwell announced that he intended to found the Mises Institute, he was liter literally ordered not to do so by the representative of a big do donor to the Austrian libertarian movement. Incidents like these explain why Rothbard literally clapped his hands for joy when Lou Rockwell informed him that he was founding the Mises Institute. What about Mises' attitude toward Rothbard? Uh, as we said, Rothbard was a devoted follower and student of Mises. Mises considered Rothbard to be his intellectual heir. In the, in the past decade, this has been denied by many of the same Austrians who had earlier tried and failed to read Mises out of the, the Austrian movement. They realized that that just could not be done because of the great body of Mises' work, so they tried another tactic. Um, and that was to deny that Rothbard was really a follower of Mises. Um, but there's an abundance of evidence, some of which has come to light in the last year as we go through the, the, um, the archives of, of Rothbard, which we have here. We have all his papers and memos and correspondence. Um, so much of this evidence suggests that these critics are very wrong and that Mises himself explicitly regarded Rothbard as a brilliant contributor to praxeological economics. Mises even indicated that he himself had learned from Rothbard's writings. Mises reviewed Rothbard's treatise on economic theory, man, economy, and state, and enthusiastically endorsed it. He praised the book as an epical contribution to the general science of human action, unquote. He went on to declare, quote, henceforth, all essential studies in these branches of knowledge will have to take full account of the theories and criticisms expounded by Dr. Rothbard, unquote. Anyone who's at all familiar with Mises' writing knows that Mises was rarely lavish or generous in his praise of the works of other authors. In fact, he said once, uh, there, uh, quote, there never lived at the same time more than a score of men, 20 men, whose work contributed anything essential to economics, unquote. Uh, yet Mises extravagantly praised Rothbard's treatise, despite the fact that parts of the book were intended to correct, improve upon, and fill in the gaps that Mises left in uh, human action. This interpretation of, of Mises' very positive attitude toward Rothbard 
is reinforced when we examine Mises' reaction to the most notable instance in which Rothbard in explicitly rejected one of Mises' doctrines. And you'll learn about that this week. I'm referring to the theory of monopoly price. Mises had conceded that the formation of monopoly price above the competitive price was theoretically conceivable in a free market, but highly unlikely to occur, to occur in practice. Rothbard argued to the contrary, that the distinction between a monopoly and a competitive price was conceptually meaningless in a free market where there were no government barriers. Um, monopoly price can only emerge as a result of a government grant to, to some group or, or industry, uh, a grant of privilege, of special legal privilege. Now, Mises once asked his opinion of Rothbard's disagreement with his theory of, of, of monopoly price by the Spanish economist who translated human action. His name was uh, Joaquin uh, Rice. Um, this occurred at the Mont Pelerin Society in 1965. The Spanish economist Jesus Huerta de Soto um, reported that when Rice himself used to recount this incident, he would quote Mises' response as, and I'm quoting, I agree with every word Professor Rothbard has written on the subject, unquote. Just recently, another piece of evidence turned up confirming Mises' approval of Rothbard's interpretation of his economic theory and method. In a letter he wrote in late 1962 to a fellow Mont Pelerin Society member, which was an international society, the Mont Pelerin Society of, of, of free market economists and other social scientists, uh, in this letter that he wrote to the French philosopher Louis Rougier, uh, Mises responded to criticisms of one of his books by R Rougier. Um, in summing up his position, Mises wrote, the proof of the cake is in the eating, I can only refer to the systematic exposition of the whole doctrine of praxeology in my book, Human Action. And then he goes on and says, and nowadays in the brilliant book of a younger man, Marianne Rothbard, Man, Economy, and State. So he's looking on, on um, Mar uh, Murray Rothbard as his successor, as his heir. So Mises clearly considered Rothbard's treatise as an updating and development of his, of his own economic theory. But this isn't all. After a, pra a, pra a paragraph recommending to Rougier his earlier book on the methodology of economics, that is the earlier book that Mises has ri had written, Mises closed the letter with a, pre a plea to Rougier. Um, he said, but please, first of all, read the book of Rothbard. It is very interesting also from the epistemological point of view. Okay, so he's saying, first of all, read Rothbard's book, okay, which was... was in, his, in, in, in Mises' view, sort of, 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 of the completion of the system of praxeology. Um, so given the evidence, including, including the words of Mises himself, I think there, there remain, that there remains little doubt that the, the mainline Misesian tradition in economic theory and method runs through Murray Rothbard, um, who is the, the inspiration behind the founding of the Mises Institute, and who, who the faculty have either known or, or have read his works with, 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 with great diligence. Over the past year, we have found a small treasure in, in the Rothbard archives here at Mises University um, that corroborates the evidence I just, ju just cited. And one small nugget in, in this uh, treasure trove is, is an inscription that Mises wrote into uh, Rothbard's copy of his third edition, Mises' third edition of the human action, okay? And it says, to Murray N. Rothbard, pioneer of praxeological analysis with all good wishes. So, I mean, he's called Rothbard a pioneer. I mean, that's someone who's breaking new ground. So given the evi this evidence, um, I cannot understand how uh, Israel Kirzner, who was a student and, and the graduate assistant of, of Ludwig von Mises, how he could say in an interview in 2006, um, Murray Rothbard was a genius. There is no doubt about it. I don't believe that he fully understood Mises. I believe that he struggled honestly to do so, but he didn't provide a satisfactory Misesian economics as far as I am concerned." Unquote. Uh, well, I think there's abundant evidence that Mises, could have that Mises would have disagreed with, with Professor Kersner. Okay, with that background, now I want to um, get to the uh, int faculty introductions. Uh, this week you'll hear lectures from a very distinguished faculty of economists, historians, philosophers and a very brilliant legal scholar, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Um, I am especially proud to inform you that more than half of the faculty has attended, or even more, more, more than half, uh, well more, has attended Mises University as students, uh, some recently as 2010. 
Excuse me. Uh, on the other hand, some of the older faculty have sat in Murray Rothbard's living room at the very beginning of, 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 of the Austrian economics revival, way back in the 1970s. Uh, but regardless of age, all members of the faculty have devoted themselves to studying, teaching, and writing Austrian economics for their entire adult lives. And all have been greatly influenced by the works of Mises and Rothbard. So this week, you have a wonderful opportunity to learn from the leading lights of the modern Austrian school. So all we ask of you is that you really take full advantage of the program and, and show up on time and be eager and listen and, and ask questions, okay? We like, to, we like to have questions. We like to be pushed on, on, on the things that we're, we're telling you. We don't want you just to sit here and, be, and be, be automatons or receptacles for what we're saying, okay? We want to see a spark of, of energy. We want to see a spark of, of dissent. Um, but we'll... As we go along, we'll have faculty panels where you're, you're able to, 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 to um, express yourselves and, and ask your questions. Uh, before I, I do introduce the, the Mises U faculty present, I have several reminders for students. Uh, please remember to wear your name tags when attending Mises U sessions and meals. All students on scholarship are required to attend classes each class period. No visitors are allowed at meals, sessions, or social hours because of the so-called pandemic. Finally, please do not rearrange chairs at meals. Social distancing requires a limit on the number of chairs at each table. So I better not see a seventh or eighth chair, okay, at, at a given table. I mean, I know if you get stuck at Professor Klein's table, I, he's not a great conversationalist. You may want to move to, to Salerno or Patrick Newman. Okay, but please refrain from doing that, okay? Sit there and listen to Peter. Listen closely, he's interesting. Um, so if you violate any of these policies, there'll be a, a sort of a masked crew, especially trained by Professor Hans Hoppe, that's going to sh <laughs> in the a priori of, of argumentation, and they'll physically remove you from the pre premises. OK, so here, uh, fa uh, now uh, the faculty introductions forthwith. Walter Block will come to us on Zoom. Um, uh, so he will not be here in person. Um, if you're here, please stand up and hold your applause until the end. Mark Branley. Mark, please stand up. Hold your applause. Per Bieland. Per. Thomas DiLorenzo. Jeffrey Herbener. Peter, the aforementioned Peter Klein. Don't say anything, Peter. Just, uh, <laughs> um, Judge Andrew Napolitano is not here. He'll be here tomorrow. Jonathan Newman. Patrick Newman. Now, now both. You can sit down, Patrick. <laughs> Both Newmans refer to the other as the bad Newman, but, but since uh, value subjective, you guys can figure it out for yourselves, <laughs> who, who's who. Um, Sean Rittenauer. Timothy Terrell, I don't think he's here, but he'll, he will be here shortly. Mark Thornton, who's not here, and Tom, Tom Woods, who will also be here uh, tomorrow. Um, OK, thank you very much. And Uh, now the uh, president of Mises, of Mises Institute will um, address us, Jeff Deist. Thanks, Joe. It's good to see a lot of familiar faces, some people I've met before, uh, either here or down the road somewhere. I see Mr. Jamie in there in the back has joined us. Good to see you. You know, Tho mentioned civilization earlier, and I, it struck me that all of you had to come to Auburn, Alabama this week to find it. <laughs> and of course, we're very enthused that, that we're actually having a live event, a physical event. Uh, but it's interesting that we couldn't hold something like this in New York City right now. Not in Mises's New York, in Rothbard's New York, not even in Judge Andrew Napolitano's New York, because at the moment anyway, some of the most expensive real estate on earth and some of the most luxurious retail stores on the planet are boarded up graffitied, vandalized, burned, looted, while the government's security agents retreated and let it happen. We certainly couldn't be meeting in Portland this week, where Antifa has held violent riots for 45 straight nights unopposed. And we couldn't be meeting in Seattle, at least not in the Capitol Hill neighborhood, which over the past decade or so has gentrified and produced condominiums which sell for a million dollars, or did, we'll see. 
So instead, we're meeting in Auburn, Alabama, and I think that's uh, worth noting. Now, it doesn't mean, of course, that we've been unaffected by COVID here or by some of the protests stemming from the murder of George Floyd. We have been affected in Auburn. Uh, for several months, we had a 10-person limit, I guess, on events. Fortunately, that was lifted, which allowed us to plan this event. Uh, we have had um, you know, some problems with Auburn University. Normally, we rent a dormitory from them, and that allows us to have about 125 students. But because they wouldn't allow us to have a dormitory, we had to limit uh, attendance here to only 50. And we reduced the faculty ab about in half to just the most essential 10. Is that right, Peter? The most truly, yes. Um, <laughs> the cheapest, the, the most available faculty here this week. Uh, and, and so that certainly affected us, and we are engaging in social distancing just in case any of the uh, powers that be in the city of Auburn should come snooping around. And this week, as a matter of fact, tomorrow, they are getting set to, uh, to have a Zoom meeting with the city council and consider a mandatory mask ordinance for the city. Uh, we don't think that that's going to be voted on or possible before Thursday, so it shouldn't affect me as you, but the point here is that... Um, we're not immune from these things in our bucolic little college town. But uh, as a result of all this, one of the happy occurrences for all of you is you're staying at the Auburn Hotel, which I think some of the people who have attended Mises U before will tell you might be preferable to the dorm <laughs> and a roommate when it comes to television and Wi-Fi and other things. And so we hope that you all enjoy that and get together and uh, you know, uh, socialize on your own because we won't be having some of the things we normally have in the evening, some of the happy hours, some of the karaoke and bars because of the, uh, the COVID circumstances. And we're confident that all of you will acquit yourselves well at the Auburn Hotel as representatives of this organization and at a uh, facility where we do a lot of business, by the way. So they ought to be very, very nice to you because we're a big customer. But speaking of civilization, I wanted to just talk briefly about sort of the task before you, not only this week, but more generally as young people, as students, as intellectually minded people. And I really do commend you for finding your way here, uh, which is something that I never did. Uh, it's certainly an advantage to you at this stage in your undergraduate lives or your graduate life uh, to sort of have the accelerated program that Mises U provides. And you'll definitely learn more in a week here uh, in terms of what we would consider anyway correct economics than you would in, in probably several courses in undergrad anywhere. But, you know, the question is, what should you do, what can you do, regardless of whether you're an economics major or someone interested in the Austrian school? And I was struck earlier this year that PBS has a new program, a frontline program, if you recall that series, called Divided America. And it featured a bunch of people like Robert Reich and Mitt Romney and people you don't much want to hear from. <laughs> and, and of course, Divided America was filmed before the George Floyd uh, pr protests and before COVID. So looking back on it now, the degree of division being discussed seems sort of quaint almost. But there was one that, which featured Steve Bannon who is sort of a populist architect on the right and was uh, influential, important in Donald Trump's 2016 campaign. And he spoke about how, in his view, we live in post-persuasion America, meaning that you know, the cost of information is so cheap. We all have these cell phones, and it comes to us instantaneously. You don't have to really go out and search very hard to, to develop your politics or your ideology or, or your worldview. And so we're really, everyone's sort of dug in and just believes what they believe. And so now it's all just about mobilization of forces. And that we aren't really working on ideas or persuasion any longer at this point. Sort of a jaded or pessimistic view, but I understand what he's saying. And of course, by mobilization, he met mobilization at the polls. Now, a few months later, we were talking about mobilization in the streets. So a little bit different animal. But I was really struck by that. And it, it made me recall, uh, some of you will know the great social theorist and libertarian writer, Albert J. Nock, um, who was famous for, among other things, his memoirs of a superfluous man and it, you know, where, wherein he describes from an earlier article the idea of the remnant. And for Nock, 
The remnant is, is, consists of sort of a small minority who understands the nature of the state and society and who would become influential only after the current dangerous course has become thoroughly and obviously untenable. And we don't know when that degree of untenable happens. And so he was speaking of people like you. And let me quote uh, Nock here saying that uh, when speaking of the remnant, we do not pretend to believe that everyone is educable. For we know on the contrary that very few are educable, very few indeed. So again, a, a little fatalistic, a bit pessimistic, and I wonder um, how true that is. But I also take a look at a lot of organizations in this country, and I realize that majoritarianism is not really what it takes. Um, Nassim Taleb has a really interesting essay on the tyranny of the minority and how minorities get what they want. And if you read that, I think you'll find that it might bear a lot of application to the kind of political uh, uh, worldview we would like to see forwarded. So th the task before all of you, as I see it, is really twofold and, and sort of at odds almost. There's a dichotomy between uh, disengaging in many ways with the culture, with the mindset, with the system, but then also engaging with it in, in a meaningful way, in a way that will hopefully at least improve your life, if not improve the broader society. So by disengagement, what do I mean? I mean that there's an awful lot of white noise out there. There's an awful lot of dumbed down content. There's an awful lot of social media vying for your precious time and attention. Uh, there's an awful lot of podcasters out there who don't know very much and just sort of have banter for hours at a time. And I would argue that there's a lot of value to you in disengaging from all this and being the kind of people who will actually read thousand-page books. And sometimes when you look at the news cycle and you think of everything going on, it seems sort of useless. Oh, my gosh, why are we bothering with this man, economy, and state? We ought to be out there on the ramparts. And I get that. But my question for you is, as fewer and fewer people in our society are actually capable of any sort of serious or sustained intellectual work, or even capable of reading or having the attention span to read a 900-page book, does that make the people who can do it more important or less? I would argue it makes them more important. So maybe in, instead of thinking in terms of the remnant, you ought to be thinking of yourselves more in terms of the vanguard. So once you disengage from certain parts of the culture and engage with the better parts of the culture, the more cerebral parts of the culture, I think you'll find yourself armed with truth and knowledge that your peers lack. And the problem with arming yourself with truth and knowledge is that once you have it, once you know it, it's awfully hard to ignore it. It almost uh, imposes on you a duty of sorts to go out there and do what you can do. Once you know, it's hard to unknow. And I, I do think that my own views on this have changed a little bit. Even maybe a decade ago, I would have argued or counseled for uh, a younger person to, to basically ignore politics, to lead a non-political life, to avoid ideology, uh, to certainly learn economics, but that you, know, you, you should work on just bettering yourself, uh, setting yourself up to maybe have a, a financially rewarding life, to have a family, to do all the kinds of things that make you personally happy, and then improve the world on the sort of the granular level, and, and forget about politics. But you know, today it's awfully hard to argue that. You know, the wokesters are coming for you. <laughs> and they're interested in you whether you're interested in them or not. So I'll leave with this. We're going to go downstairs, have a happy hour with some beer and wine uh, outside or sort of in the conservatory. I don't know if it's still raining. But I'll leave you with this. Uh, you know, there's this, this bizarre idea within sort of... Uh, I guess I'll say small l libertarian circles, that economic issues and social issues are two different things. And that you have to focus on one or the other and that they're very, very different and all you econ people care about is you know, a GP and money and you know, you'd, you'd sell your grandmother for a, a, another couple points of GDP. You know, you, this, uh, this sort of uh, idea of homo economicus 
as, as a caricature, right? And that's sort of the Steve Forbes, Wall Street Journal concept of, of economics. But if you think about that, and if you really learn what you should learn this week, you'll find that human action and scarcity and choice, and especially the division of labor and trade among humans, is the, is the absolute source of all social cooperation. As a matter of fact, Mises almost called human action social cooperation. That was a working title for the book at one point. So there's no dichotomy between economics and, and the stuff of life, between economics and social or cultural issues. These are all bound up. They're all one thing. And by learning just what you learned this week, if you apply yourself, I guarantee you that you will, you will find yourself in better stead than 99% of your peers at school. So thanks very much, and we'll see you downstairs.